Well, hello, everyone. It's my enormous pleasure to introduce our new podcast, Time to Shine, where we're going to talk all things Shining Time Station. My name is Adrian. I'm also known as Northern Star on Twitter, and I am not joined alone. I have my lovely co-host, Mike, here with me. Hello, everybody. It is Mike. You may know me as The Buried Truck on Twitter. I am so excited to be doing this podcast. I'm honored that I get to do it with Adrian, first of all, but... Oh. The fact that we get to talk about a show that is so near and dear to our heart is just all the more better. So I'm very excited to dive into this. Likewise, likewise. I, um, For those of you who don't know, I have another little podcast called Train of Thought that I've been doing. And when I finally got the invite to do this, I was so excited because talking about Shiny Time Station, it's just, you know, such a passion of mine. And the show meant a lot to me as a kid. So yeah, great to be here, Mike. Absolutely. Yeah, it's. I, I feel like... People are always aware of Shining Time Station, but I feel like especially as time has gone on and maybe as it's faded from the memory of the public, uh, it it's it kind of gets overlooked in the grand scheme of the Thomas franchise and the Thomas universe. So I think this is going to shed some new light for sure. I hope so, because it's really a disservice to the show when you think about, you know, it was pulling in just over 7 million viewers at its height. And now people don't really even recall it. And I think maybe part of that might be the fact that, you know, they stopped broadcasting it around, I think, 2000. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, people just, people, it was a part of people's lives and they recall it when it's mentioned, but it's more distant. And Thomas is still so much more prevalent. So I hope that we can reinvigorate the Shining Time passion and uh, just get that out there. Exactly. Now, I'm I'm curious, Adrian. Like, what's your earliest memory of Shining Time Station, and what 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 did it mean to you growing up? Mm, it's a hard one because I often go back and forth, and I say, you know, did I did I watch a Thomas VHS first and then Shining Time Station? Mm -hmm. But I'm pretty sure, yeah, I got into Thomas first, and my earliest memory of Shining Time is basically through my grandma. So I remember. I remember being like out front her house near the garden and her saying, you know, there's this new show that has Thomas stories in it. And, you know, I think the first thing she said was there was a jukebox band of like little puppets <laughs> playing, you know, <laughs> cowboy songs. And as a kid, I was like, okay. Um, and that, I think that's one of the first things she told me. And I mean, obviously I was, I was pretty into Thomas at that point. I think I'd, I'd watched the Thomas gets tricked and the James learns the lesson VHSs and rented those. So I was a pretty big fan. And, um, and so she started recording the second season for me as it was coming out in 91, I believe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, for me, it just, it was an instant connection. It was kind of love at first sight. And I, I, yeah, I have a vague memory of like, you know, coming back to my childhood farm and, and having either that show in my mind or watching it for the first time around then. And it just, it just flowed so well. And I just, I just became obsessed with it to the point that, yeah, it's hard to remember exactly how that unfolded, but it just became a fixture in my life. Yeah. And, um, I, I really loved the station component. I know a lot of folks sort of say, you know, I watched Shining Time for the Thomas stories and I found the in-person component not as compelling. But mm -hmm. for me, it drew me in. It felt it felt real. It felt nostalgic. It felt lived in. Um, and it just was this sort of welcoming platform, um, you know, for the Thomas stories. And but I, I think also took on this uh, on a life of its own because I knew the Thomas stories already. And sometimes I would even fast forward them um, if I knew them really well and watch the you know, the station kind of sitcom element. So I, I think that that part of the show is underrated. Uh, as much as the show is a vehicle for Thomas, it also really had a spirit of its own. It made this sort of, you know, railroad lore world uh, for people to engage in and for kids to get nostalgic about railroads again in a very, uh, I don't know, a very real way. I don't know about you, Mike, but it always felt like a real station to me. Oh, every, everything about it felt real to me. Like even, I mean, I, I'm I'm pretty sure this is the thing. My earliest conscious memory, Thomas has always been in my life. Um, yeah. You know, I can't remember a time where I was, you know, aware of my surroundings and I wasn't totally into the show as well. Um, and like, you know, Thomas itself, obviously, with the amount of work that went into designing the sets and bringing the world to life... You know, yeah. it, it didn't feel like it was a model train show. 
I thought as a kid that the island of Sodor was a real place and that these were real steam engines that people just happened to be filming. And, Absolutely. <laughs> you know, but that also extends to Shining Time Station itself because it just felt like it yeah. was such a... It didn't have the... You know, as much as there is comedy in it with, obviously, with Schemer and, you know, the secondary yeah. characters like the mayor and Midge Smoot and all that, unlike a lot of the other kids' shows at the time, it didn't feel like it was a goofy world, per se. It, it felt like these were yeah. all... It felt like you knew someone like all of those people in your life, and that just made it so much more real. And, you know, like, it, as you say, I mean, Thomas really was the main draw. Let's not... You know, well, we won't sugarcoat it. That that it yeah. was a vehicle yeah. for Thomas to be broken into North America, but Definitely. at the same time, like the station segments were so entertaining, and you know, I, I mentioned Schemer. He was always such a source of comedy. Um, yeah. As a kid, I I wanted to be an engineer like Billy Two Feathers. No. He, I absolutely <laughs> did. I thought he was the coolest. They were all so fun. Like all these characters have such good yeah. qualities to them. So, you know, it, it's just, it's such a wonderful show. And I yeah. think if people don't really pay attention to it, I think they're going to be missing out on a lot of cool things. Um, yeah. Obviously, it's, you know, the history of uh, what it meant for Thomas outside of the UK aside. Mm -hmm. The show itself does stand on its own two legs because it was just so wonderfully done. And Britt and Rick really, you can tell how much heart and soul they put into it and and that goes for everybody else who worked on it it was definitely a passion yeah. show i completely agree and i remember when i was chatting with rick and he said you know you have these shows sometimes once in a lifetime where all the right players align yes and you have people that are the best in all their different areas whether it be puppetry you know lighting set design mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. acting and he said this was one of those rare times where that just all came together and it worked. Um, totally. I really like, too, what you, um, what you said about the characters being relatable because I felt like I could just be in that world as one of the children. And the children felt like, you know, they could be kids at school or something. And I believed it. Like, I never... I know people looking at the show now will say, oh, you know, I, I notice there aren't actually that many passengers going through Shining Time Station, you know, as the, <laughs> as the sort of story is progressing. And as a kid, I never noticed that. Me neither. I, I, oddly, I just believed that this was a station, that it was a real historic old place, and that, you know, their struggle to keep the station alive and, you know, keep it from the threat of being closed by J.B. King. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It all... yeah. I, I didn't question it, but it, so it's interesting to look back and have people note those things now. But I think as kids, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily think the same way. And when you have a world that feels believable, it's just like, okay, there we go. Exactly. That's, I, and you know what, it's funny that you say that because I think now of the episodes where they did have a lot of passengers in the station and it's, mm, oh. it's kind of like, whoa, this is a bit of an overload. And you're almost relieved yeah. when like the station kind of clears and you're left with the familiar faces of, you know, Stacy, Billy, the kids, Mr. C, I agree. you know, so yeah. it, it, it's interesting because that <laughs> I'd yeah. never thought about that until you said it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny. And oddly, I, I think sometimes I do find the passengers a bit distracting. Uh -huh. And I think because in the first season, I think it was probably the most minimalist in that respect. And I, rem I seem to remember more in seasons two. And I think especially three, there being more crowds and throngs going through um, and people engaging with the passengers more, I think. I, I seem to remember season one, there would be a lot of sort of one-off passengers that would have something to do with the plot of the story, um, like a key element. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, I think that, I think they kind of amp things up a bit later, but correct me if I'm wrong, but that's just sort of the... No, you're 100% on the money. And that's that's kind of the funny thing. Um, it, it's interesting that we're going to be talking about season one episodes today too, because when yes. I was growing up, I think, because I was born in 1992, so by that point, season two had ended. Okay. They were, yeah. I think, just about to start with season three pretty soon. And I think at that point, they had kind of phased the season one episodes out of syndication. Because exactly. I, I don't have any memory of season one from a kid, except for, obviously, really? the Christmas special, because we had that on VHS. Of course. But I remember when I was... It was a couple of years ago, and I was just on YouTube wanting to like find some of the old episodes that I hadn't seen in a while, and I stumbled across mm -hmm. a playlist of the season one episodes, 
and Mm -hmm. it was like rediscovering the show all over again because none of them were familiar to me i had never seen ringo as mr conductor outside of that one vhs yeah um i didn't know who harry was like it, it's oh, it was such yeah. an interesting thing to go back to not as a child but as someone who grew up with a different part of the show yeah and being able to see that contrast and you're absolutely right like viewing those episodes they didn't focus on the station being as busy per se it was yeah. like if you did have passengers they kind of went out of their way to make them like memorable one-off passengers too exactly exactly so how old were you when you saw season one for the first time then Oh God, I was, uh, when was that? <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> not, not to like challenge your brain. I know, brain I know. I, sh- I should be remembering this much easier, but I want to say I, it wasn't until I was like 26 or 27. That's amazing. Yeah. Like it, I, it just, in, and I was like, I've got to remember some of this, surely. Yeah. Watch through the whole season. Yeah. None of it was familiar, but it was like when I got to the end, I was just so enthralled, and I there was oh definitely a lot of binge watching of season one okay. because I was just so taken with it. Good, I'm glad to hear that because I know again some these are just rumblings I've heard, but sometimes people are like, "Well, season one, you know, the show's hitting its stride." But for me, uh, like you, I started with season. You started with season two, right? You said uh, season three. I think I technically would have started with season three. Oh, interesting. Okay, so I started with season two as it was being aired and watched all those episodes. And then um, season one was on YTV. Mm -hmm. Uh, It must have been the in-between. So it must have been around 92 when it was in between the second and third seasons. Yeah. And my grandma recorded all of those as well. I mean, she recorded the entire series for me, but I remember coming to season one, having watched season two, and and I loved it. It felt... I, like I, I, I can't describe it, but I remember going back to my season one tapes a lot for the nurturing, for the seeing the start of of the episode. And that's kind of it's a good, I think, lead into us talking about um, the first episode of this series, which is a place unlike any other, because that's when I got to see. I'm like, oh, the station is covered in cobwebs. Mm-hmm. Oh, but I've seen it already, mm-hmm. and I, I think my mind had to sort of jog back and be like, okay. And, oh, these are different kids. And then, you know, I watched that whole season and then came, and then I think, then season three came out. And then I watched that with new Thomas stories, which was exciting. But, um, yeah, I can't say enough about season one, but, and we could talk all day, but I think let's get into, let's get into the first episode. We thought that would be a really great place to start the podcast. Absolutely. Um, and also it's one of my favorite episodes of the season, um, and I know often in TV shows, you don't get that. You know, often the first episode or two, they're kind of hitting their stride. You know, actors are developing the characters, but it initially felt like home for me. So I'll, um, I'll just give a brief summary of the episode for everyone. If you haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend Absolutely. <laughs> checking it out. <laughs> Where should we begin? Let's begin with the painting. Oh, it's a beauty, isn't it? The episode begins with the magical Mr. Conductor vanishing into a cloud of gold dust as the lovely Stacy Jones introduces an old, old railroad station called, of course, Shining Time Station, to her nephew, Matt. So Stacy shows him around, talks about her plans to restore the station to its former glory when her grandmother actually used to be the station manager, and then this is a role that Stacy will now fill. Matt then plays a song on the jukebox, and we get to meet the lovely jukebox band puppets for the first time. Um, (laughs) Oh, I got their names. Um, Tex, Rex, (laughs) Dee Dee, Tito, and Grace. And then while cleaning, Matt meets the magical Mr. Conductor for the first time, who surprises him and then tells him his first Thomas story, which is Thomas Gets Tricked. Then a railroad engineer, Harry Cupper, arrives with his granddaughter, Tanya, to look at the station and decide if he would like to work there uh, as an engineer full-time. Stacy then introduces Harry to his new workshop, and after Matt gets a little bit startled by Harry, Mr. C appears again and tells another introductory Thomas story, Edward Helps Out. And finally, Harry decides to stay, much to everyone's joy and excitement, and concludes that there's just something about this place. The famous line. Which becomes somewhat of a catchphrase. <laughs> that, um, 
that kind of persists. And it's funny because I recently rewatched uh, the uh, Becky Makes a Wish episode where Schemer as Stacy parodies that line. I think, oh, <laughs> I really, it really stayed throughout the series. I love that it, you know they keep coming back to it. Um, I, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but I'm very excited for when we eventually get to Becky Makes a Wish true. because it's just one of the most comedic episodes ever. Oh, it's... It's so good, and <laughs> it's so it's so great learning too that that's one of you know Dee Dee and Brian's favorite. They just had such a blast. I think they also nailed each other's characters, but save that for a future episode. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, you know, just initial impressions for me. I I think it's a great series premiere. It really gives everyone a lovely introduction to the station building itself and all the different parts of the station as she takes Matt through, you know, um, the information desk, ticket booth, the arcade, the waiting area, the workshop eventually with Harry. And so through all that exposition with her explaining it to Matt, us as the viewers, the kids, and now the um, nostalgia seeking adults get to learn about all the different parts of the station, meet Mr. C, and then also being introduced to Thomas through those stories and those stories being the first two episodes of series one. Um, of Thomas the Tank Engine. So in terms of trivia, I was looking up a few little facts about the episode. So it's interesting, speaking of the Thomas stories, in the credits, we see that they actually use the UK titles. Oh, interesting. Yeah, which I didn't realize. And so either that means that they didn't update that in time, or maybe that Dr. Slaby was still working on the Americanizing piece. Because as a lot of you know, not only was Dr. Slaby a series advisor in that he received each script, each, I believe it was uh, each outline for an episode, and then each first draft would review that and then send it back to Rick Sigilko. Um, but he also did that with the Thomas stories, right. uh, changing, changing all the different components. Um, but I thought that was kind of funny. That's yeah. interesting, because now I'm trying to think of the timeline of, like, Shining Time airing versus when the first standalone Thomas VHS came out in the U.S. That's a good point, right? And I think the first one came out in 91 or 90? I think um, 90. And that would make sense then, because 90, yeah. season one of Shining Time was in 89. Exactly, yeah. Oh, so interesting. Because this came out January 29th of 1989 so yeah that you're probably right they're probably still in that process and knowing that kids aren't going to look at something like that right i also read that the first uh the, the first episode's title was debated over for a while um i don't know what the other suggestions were but i my guess is maybe they called it something about this place or or something like that and then landed on a place unlike any other right we can only theorize of course yeah yeah so what are your what are your kind of impressions of the of the first app, Mike? Well, looking back on this episode and kind of rewatching it in anticipation of recording this, um, one thing I really like about it is, as you kind of noted there, how they go about introducing everything. Because mm-hmm. I feel like with other kids shows, you know, you would have got a very kind of in your face like, hi, my name is Stacy Jones. This is my nephew, Matt. But <laughs> yeah. they don't actually introduce each other. Like, they, they just show right. up in the station, and Stacy starts telling Matt about the station. And it's during those interactions where they're kind of, you know, playing station master and passenger that you first learn their names. Absolutely. And kind of, you know, it, it, there's not really much explanation needed to who they are. You can really figure it out on your own. Um, and I think the same goes for when Mr. Conductor first shows up, too. Because you've yeah. got this magical little man... <laughs> and this kid who is startled by it, but never once does Matt ask, like, who or what are you? Like, how are how is this possible? It's just yes. like, this is Mr. Conductor, and he travels everywhere doing railroad work. And now he's going to tell you a story about trains. There's no explanation of the logistics yeah. behind it. And I really like that because it just leaves this mystery of, like, fill in the blanks, draw your own conclusions yeah. about what Mr. Conductor is. You know, it's not going to be laid out and explained cut and dry to you. I completely agree. And I think in line with that is that this show didn't feel like it played down to kids. I think what I what irks me about a lot of modern TV shows or ones that I've seen in the last maybe 10, 15 years 
is that like you said, Mike, it's the kind of the patronizing, like, I am Stacy Jones, the head of the station, and mm-hmm. this is my nephew Matt, and like this is a magical man, and this is what happens. The fact that we just kind of hit the ground running, it really just trusts in kids' ability to make sense of a world in their own way. I don't think, like, I think people really underestimate kids' intelligence a lot of the time. And I see this with a lot of the parents. uh, As some of you know, my background is in psychotherapy. A lot of the parents that I work with, you know, they'll say, I'm trying to protect my kids from this. Or, you know, I don't want them to hear this. And I'm saying, your kids are picking it all up. You know, they just, they know, they can attune to things really fast. So in a similar fashion, I think a child watching this for the first time can just accept these things, even though they may seem extremely bizarre. Like you said, a little man who's like, I live in a signal house. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, is it, you'd think some people would be terrified by that today, but it just worked. It does. And it, it works because, I mean, Shining Time Station is the least threatening place I can think of, really. I mean, <laughs> I, I can't imagine any kid watching this show and not feeling like it, it's like getting a hug. It really is. That's I love that. It's, it's just that. so safe. It's it's perfect. Yeah. So, yeah, I completely agree. I think it's it's kind of funny because they, with the live action stuff, they kind of mirrored the Thomas format of just telling mm. the story and letting the moral speak for itself. They aren't going to stop the show and explain things yeah. to you. Just yeah. follow along the storyline. You'll learn what you need to pick up. Yeah, it just, it, it works. It flows. Um, it's, it's... Uh... It's just, like you said, it's like a hug. It's warm. Um, I will say I noticed as a kid that the intensity of the uh, storylines and the emotion of the characters does ramp up as we get kind of three quarters of the way through series one. And we'll come to that later. But I remember as a kid being shocked by, like, for example, Stacy yelling and getting, you know, visibly tearful. Oh, yeah. But I think that works kind of naturally with the progression of the show. As we get to know the characters, kids start to feel safer then it's like, okay, we can go to these places where adults are dealing with more threatening situations mm-hmm. like the station closing, um, people losing their jobs, things like that. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I, I completely agree. It's done in such a such a natural way that even when those less than positive emotions come up, it's yeah. not in a way that unsettles you or makes you feel like, oh, I, I'm, I'm kind of scared by this. Like, it, it's very yeah. natural. Exactly. So... We're going to break down some of the different components of the episode. So first of all, um, we meet the jukebox band quite early on. And um, I loved the puppets as a kid. Me I know too. a lot of people. Okay, I'm glad to hear it because a lot of people now are like, you know, these puppets terrify me. <laughs> I, I thought they were great and wacky and weird. And I love the little set with the nickel coming down. And uh, I don't know, Mike, like. Back me up here. I, I complete. <laughs> listen, there are far scarier puppets out there than the jukebox <laughs> band. Let's just get that out in the open right now. The jukebox Absolutely. band is so. I love that each of them is such a distinct personality too. Like you can very easily yeah. recall who's who. You know what mm-hmm. they were all about. Um, mm-hmm. Credit to the performers too, not like the puppeteers and also the vocalists who sang the songs because they're all just so talented and. You know, they made the puppets so expressive and really brought them to life. Absolutely. And so, you know, um, we had some folks, you know, obviously, as they were recording the puppet segments, they were voicing the characters at the same time. And then the songs, the songs had been pre-recorded beforehand. Um, and some some of the puppeteers did both uh, the uh, voice as well as the singing voice such as Venice Thomas. She was on my first podcast. She's such a talent. Oh, she, and she her actually, voice is unbelievable. Isn't it? It's so good. It's so good. And she sings this first song, um, I've Been Working on the Railroad, which, I mean, is a, I think it's a great start because it's, like, it's a classic railroad song. Everyone knows it. Kids can sing along or kind of bop along.
like you said, you get a flavor for each individual band member. And the fact that I didn't know this until recently, that each band member represents a different musical style. Mm -hmm. So we've got we got soul with grace. We've got kind of the mod drummer with Dee Dee. We've got Texan Rex for country. And then we've got Tito. Uh, oh, I can't remember what Tito was, actually. Tito is more of like the the swing jazz, jazz kind right? of guy. Swing jazz. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, so you kind of see that early on, and 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 we also get a little bit of exposition from Dee Dee saying, like, D- sorry, not Dee Dee or Dee Dee Khan, but Dee Dee the drummer, <laughs> saying that you know, um, as Matt is peering in the machine, they can only he can only hear them talking when they sing a song. So all the little like you know the little in betweens they can't see, and mm-hmm. he also can't see the puppets. So it just they remain this sort of shrouded mystery with this seemingly you know I would say omnipotent jukebox Mm -hmm. choosing when it wants to play and sometimes playing something different (laughs) (laughs) yeah that's i mean it's such an interesting world and the thing that i like about this song and how they've chosen this one for the introductory Mm -hmm. episode which i don't think you really get with the remaining jukebox songs is that as the song's happening you're also getting little ad libs from the other band members (laughs) which i really love it just it's a great introduction to like Okay, the Tex and Rex are kind of the humorous ones. Um, when when they're like, who's Dinah? Exactly, yes. Like, Dinah, blow your horn? Yeah. Yes, and then, you know, Dee Dee's doing her little shouts in the back, like she's the wild one, Tito's the cool guy, and then Grace is just, like, the the absolute soul singer of the band. And it's just, oh, yeah. I love it. I think they those little flares really make such a difference, as opposed to if they just played the song straight through. Agreed. And I know one other thing that um, Craig Marin said in this podcast was like oh you know as the show progressed our camera work got fancier and stuff but i like the simplicity of the camera work in the first episode because you only have that basic overarching shot of all of them and then just focusing on individual characters no fancy slides anything and it works it works so well yeah i think it's yeah yeah, they definitely got more adventurous with the camera in the following seasons but yeah um again kind of drawing parallels to the way that the thomas episodes were filmed like series one has that very Mm -hmm static camera but it works that's a really good point that's a really good point it totally works yeah it does work um and just speaking of the thomas stories what do you think about the choice you know for the first episode's stories i think it's i mean it, it's pretty much a no-brainer that they would have gone with these right. episodes um yeah i do i have to say i really admire that for at least the first little bit of series one of shining time they followed the sequential order of the stories I think it kind of yes. keeps it more in a in a neat line. I agree, but yeah, I mean, it's it's great that uh, I obviously it's kind of a given that they're going to start with Thomas's introductory episode, um, yeah. and then to go right into obviously let's build the world a little bit more. Here's another engine. His name is Edward, and you know, yeah. here's it, it does a great job of establishing some very crucial key characters to the entire franchise. Absolutely. And from what I understand from Rick, he sort of said, you know, when we started off, um, you know, we knew early on that Ringo would be a part of the show. He was probably the first cast, obviously, because he was the voice of Thomas. For sure. And then they built Shining Time Station around that. Um, But I know, I imagine, you know, the storyboarding process for each episode, they'd kind of have an idea of which Thomas episodes they were going to incorporate look at what the sort of morals would be for that episode and then kind of piece it all together and add in different components as they saw fit. That's sort of how I see it. Maybe I don't have to tease Gordon to feel important, Thomas thought to himself, and he puffed slowly home. Thomas got a little carried away with himself. It can happen to the best of us. So those are the Thomas stories, and and like Mike said, we get a lovely introduction to Thomas in the first episode and then Edward in the second. Um, And so we're kind of learning along with Matt who these engines are, but of course, most of us who watch this show already knew these episodes by heart. So (laughs) we weren't probably (laughs) surprised. Um, I imagine some kids did learn of Thomas through this. And another interesting point is that we don't meet Schemer yet. I was going to ask you about this because this is... I believe this is the only episode we never see Schemer. <laughs> well, he was so popular, you know, after I think he joined the cast in season two um, that, you know, he was just he was a no brainer to have in every episode. But as far as I know, um, the, the whole cast had been hired already. 
Um, so it was intentional to leave Schemer out of this episode. Mm -hmm. And my theory was, you know, they're introducing a lot of worlds. Right. We got the whole station set. We've got Thomas and the island of Sodor, new engines to learn. My sense is they probably, I wonder if they were kind of piecing everything together and thinking, ooh, this is a lot to kind of show to kids. Why don't we wait for Schemer in, in episode two? And then he really gets more kind of airtime. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, Mike, but I was just yeah, kind of contemplating it. I, I think that's really a, a good way to put it is that, you know, you're getting so much with not only the world of the station, but you're meeting Stacy and Matt, you're meeting Harry and Tanya, yeah. the jukebox band, Mr. Conductor and the Thomas stories and mm. all these different things are kind of being thrown at you. Not that it's... I mean, I, I never felt like it was overwhelming kind of watching this episode, all these things being introduced. Cause again, it's, Agreed. it's always done in a gentle way with shining time. But yes. <laughs> um, I think if, because Brian is such a wonderful actor and he's such a big oh, presence, I think it's really it. smart that they waited to introduce him. I agree. And I was trying to think about this. I'm, I'm curious if, if you think different, but I really don't think the episode suffers by not having schemer involved. I agree. I never missed him. I think I noticed, I think I noticed probably by episode two that oh, I'm like, oh, there he is. And, you know, Schemer, I think is still hitting his stride. Like, I think it, you know, at first, and we'll talk about this more later, he, his character hasn't fully developed yet. Right. Um, but no, I don't miss it. Um, I like that we get to focus on all the important aspects of the station. I mean, mind you, we don't, we don't see the anything tunnel yet. Right. That comes later. Um, we do, um, get to see a few picture machine segments, mm -hmm. which I wanted to, which I wanted to talk about um, after this. But no, I do, I do agree. I don't think it suffers. I don't think so either. And you know, it they've got so much to do with you know establishing this first core group of characters that mm. it, it makes sense to kind of sideline him and leave him for the next episode because that you know it he really. <laughs> He really does deserve his own spotlight because he's just such a fantastic character. And um, speaking of he characters, is. I actually wanted to. I, this is something that's kind of struck me, and I'm curious if okay. you feel the same. But one thing I really like that they did for Tanya's introduction is, mm -hmm. you know, as we see in the episode earlier on when Matt first goes to use the picture machine, the handle on mm -hmm. it breaks, and Stacy says, "Oh, it just needs some glue," so they yes. leave it. But when Tanya and Harry arrive, she goes to try and use it. Matt says the same thing, that it just needs some glue. And she goes, no, it needs a pin. And I think that's, it's a really cool thing because she's the granddaughter of an engineer. Obviously, she's, oh, picked, up some, she's picked up some little tricks and things like that along the way. And we kind of see it a tiny bit more with Kara starting in season two. Um, you know, she's saying yes. that obviously she wants to be an engineer like her grandpa, Harry. She talks to Billy about wanting to be an engineer. It's kind of a shame that this is the only time we see that engineer side come out for Tanya. Cause I don't, I don't think it yeah. shows up again in season one from her. And it's, it's a neat little quirk. I think it's, it's cool that it shows that, you know, especially for young kids, for yeah. the female audience, like, yeah, just because you're a girl it doesn't mean you're limited in your knowledge or your ability to do anything that you want to do. Like, she can yeah. be an engineer as well as anybody. So the fact that I've... she has this knowledge, it's it's <laughs> something I wish they had played around with and integrated more. You know, that, Mike, that's such a wonderful point. And I love that you notice, I've seen this episode a million times probably, and you're noticing this. And I've never, I never put that together. It really, you know, that must have been intentional. And it is too bad they didn't, highlight that more because i think as a character tanya is incredibly capable and strong-willed oh for sure and has lots of ideas of her own um i think as a kid i remember watching this episode and seeing her so dressed up initially i was like oh la di da mm -hmm. and I, I thought she was a little snobby at first i remember thinking that for but sure. then then she has the picture machine moment and she's really kind of getting in there and she watches it and she's immersing herself more in the world and i thought you know that's quite accurate when kids go to a new place they have their guard up so it makes sense that she would be a little bit more like, oh, sure, sure. You know, she's a bit more sarcastic. You get that a bit more in the first couple of episodes. And then I think as her and, and, and Matt bond as characters and as actors, you get a bit more 
you know, relaxed feel to the character. Yeah, you definitely see that change in her. And that the point you bring up about the way that she's presented in this episode with her outfit looking, you know, a little bit more high class, per se. Oh, pristine. Um, I think that also is interesting then when you take into account the whole, like, engineer side of things. Because it tells kids, like, uh... you know, don't judge a book by its cover. This is this is someone who may look like they're all hoity-toity, but they've got Are the knowledge. Are you going to break into song? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Okay, not yet. <laughs> we, should, we, we should say we are going to have some musical segments. Um, I don't know if we'll be singing them, but that remains to be seen. Yeah, I don't know if, um, if the gonna... Time to Shine musical theater is going to be a thing, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll wait for audience audience response. Exactly. And then if, if, the, if the demand is there, we will fill it. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, that would be uh, amazing oh, and terrifying. Boy, yeah. Um, and just on the subject of uh well two things so the first being the picture machine segment mm-hmm. so we get introduced to the picture machine um as mike said before um it's broken by uh matt we see a sort of an old cartoon and we see a lot of these public domain cartoons in shiny time station i don't know the specifics of this particular one but one thing i thought about is that you know it has the sort of women lifting up their skirts and kind of that like burlesque moulin rouge mm-hmm. kind of style and it made me think, well, these kinds of picture machines were originally peep shows. That's a good point. That was their origin as far as, you know, the research that I've done. Because when I was restoring the jukebox and looking into other arcade machines, I remember reading about that and thinking, oh, my. Um, but, in you know, so I was like, oh, is that a subtle nod to the fact that, like, this will be a friendly kids picture machine. But in the past, it would show, I guess, more risque content for adults. Um, Trust Gamer yeah. to put a peep show in his arcade. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm sure Stacy was sort of like, okay, Schemer. This, like, this has got to go. <laughs> yeah, we got we to gotta get some new, uh, new things in the picture machine. And then the second segment, we get Tanya viewing, I guess maybe lo- along with Matt. And this, I will say, Mike, is one of my favorite musical segments mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. of the series. Uh, it's... A song called Start Where You Are. Um, and I always, I was always moved by this song. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. It just, there was something about the spirit. It involves this young girl who rushes excitedly to an amusement park gate, seeing that it's closed, looking all dismayed. And then all of a sudden this fellow, this young boy appears out of nowhere with, you know, a, a fancy outfit and a cane and sort of invites her in. And the whole amusement park comes alive. I would say with her imagination and creativity and then at the end, you see her waltzing away from this closed amusement park, and she throws her cap up in the air in this, like, beautiful sort of finale. And I, I remember, I actually, sorry, as I'm describing it, I'm getting, like, goosebumps. <laughs> but as a kid, as a kid, I don't know why that song made an impression on me. And interestingly, this is the only primetime Emmy that the show ever won was for this song. Really? Really, really. So it won quite a few daytime Emmys, but this was the one and only primetime Emmy. It went to Larry Grossman, who did the... Uh, music and lyrics, right? Uh, and I think one other, one other female writer that I can't recall the name of. Wow! So, off to a great start, I would say. Shiny Time Station with uh, with an Emmy Award. Uh, that's that's pretty impressive. That's nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> Hiding's only half of playing hide and seek. Gotta go and look to find what's true. Start where you are, take a magic breath, touch hands, now you're touching magic lands, and the journey's never far, cause things are stirring, fizzing, whirring, whizzing, beating, darting, meeting, parting, starting, wherever you What are your impressions of these of the picture machine initially? The picture machine, I mean, in general, it was always a very uh, it, w- it was a grab bag. You never really knew what you were going to get with the picture machine. Sometimes it was like an old timey cartoon. Sometimes it was a fully fleshed out, you know, live action thing. 
Um, and I think that kind of added to the wonder of the whole station setting is like, mm-hmm. what am I going to see today in this thing? And I, yeah. I think this is this is a great way to introduce it. You know, like it's it's I, I mean, I, I've never been huge on the vocalist of the song per se, but I still okay. really appreciate like the the emotional weight of the song because it it has a good message for kids for sure. The accompanying yeah. video is very fitting for it. I say, you know, hats off to the kids who were, you know, doing the the dancing and the choreography in that because that, yes. you know, I assume they were pretty young when that was filmed and that's not something that is easy for for young kids to nail down like that. Absolutely, they were young and interestingly, I remember hearing when they went to shoot the segment in the amusement park Unfortunately, the amusement park had taken all the chairs off the Ferris wheel. Oh, no. And the production, yeah, the production team said, oh, hey, you know, like, come on, we got it. So they put uh, every second one on. So if you look at the video clip, oh, it's not on. a fully complete Ferris wheel, but it's partially complete just to give the illusion. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting, <laughs> but it was funny. You know, things you don't notice as a kid, but I, I agree with you, Mike. I think, you know, start where you are. It's a great first message to kids that are seeing the show for the first time. You're also seeing Matt and Tanya see the station for the first time. Mm-hmm. It's just saying, you know, embrace, even though you might be a bit scared, hesitant, not sure, embrace where you're starting from and believe in a little bit of magic. Use that imagination. You know, you know you're seeing a, a conductor that's 18 inches high <laughs> a, a pop out of a wall and tell you a Thomas story. And you're like, this is kind of weird, but I like it. Just embrace it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, and I think I'll just say a nod to uh, Matt, to the lovely uh, Jason Walliner, mm-hmm. does a really great job with a surprise. Yes. Because he's, you know, in real life, he's obviously looking at a, a doll, a Groucho Marx doll, yeah. actually. <laughs> um, or a piece of tape stuck to the wall. And he does a great job of that, like, oh, okay, what's happening here? Yeah. And then he, you know, after his little Matt, Matt, Matthew calms down oh i love that and then we go or is it matthew matt matthew (laughs) (laughs) oh man um i have one last point on the actors so i know that quite a few people auditioned for these roles we had jason alexander of seinfeld fame auditioning for schemer yes which would have been a very i don't know I, I I can't see it myself. <laughs> all um, I can think I of know, is George. Like... All I can see is George Costanza as Schemer, and it's just I know. <laughs> well, I remember Rick said um, Jason portrayed him as very miserly, and I think maybe they were looking for less of a, like a grumpy old man, yeah, more of like a playful, funny trickster. Yeah, that's that. Brian yeah, Hunt. that makes sense. I'm just. It's just funny to think of, like, the George Costanza character as Schemer just being like, Jerry, it's stealing all my nickels, Jerry. <laughs> Man, I wish we could convince Jason Alexander to do, or wish, I wish we could find that, you know, tape of his edition. Oh, my God, that would be incredible. Um, it would be incredible. <laughs> I know that when Rick saw, you know, Brian edition with the kids, he said the kids could not contain their laughter. Mm-hmm. He said at first he thought they were being silent because they didn't... Um, they weren't laughing at him, but it was because they were trying to suppress their giggles mm-hmm, mm-hmm. as Schemer was delivering his lines. So I think from the get-go, it was chemistry. Yes, um, absolutely. And we had Carol King as well, auditioned for Stacy. Really? Um, really, really. I didn't know uh, that. Yeah, it's fascinating. As well as another Carol that I can't remember the name of, but some quite well-known actors. Um, that, But again, Rick said with Dee Dee, the second they that she walked out, they knew she had the part. She just had that sweet, nurturing, warm personality, and it really shines through. I can't picture okay. anyone well, but Didi Khan being Stacy Jones. Oh, I have such deep love for Didi Khan. I would just say she is such a kind, warm person in real life as well. Just in in the interactions I've had with her, and and it it comes across on screen. Oh, just from watching your other podcasts with her involved, she's such a sweetheart. Oh, I I can't. I want her to be my adoptive grandmother. <laughs> I think we all my, did. My, <laughs> my, my, well, at first I wanted to be my mom, but since my grandparents have sadly passed away, and my actually mo- most recently the grandma who recorded Shining Time Station for me and who got to see my restoration of the jukebox and 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 the podcast adventure kind of before she passed away, which meant a lot to me. Mm-hmm. Um, but I yeah, I really want her to be my surrogate grandmother at this point. Oh. Um, <laughs> Uh, she just and you know it's genuine 
she you can see she's genuine and she was also the most seasoned actor and i think it shows in her ease in front of the camera um yeah, yeah. i agree she yeah. she's and I know just such a natural you know, at the role yeah a lot to say and i know we've already said a lot about the first episode but it's you know it's i think that's because we're we're introduced to this whole new world exactly um, there's a lot of components and and we're left with that sort of magical there's something about this place and then we're waiting for the next episode mm -hmm. we really are Paid advertisement for Schemers Arcade. Schemers, 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 Schemers Arcade. Come on down to Schemers Arcade. That's right, kids. Schemer wants all of you to come right down to his world-famous arcade, located in the left-hand corner of Shining Time Station. And don't forget what Schemer always says. Spend your nickel, spend your nickel, spend them today. Spend your nickel, spend your nickel, and just go away. That's right, kids. It's games, 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 games at Schemers Arcade. You really are the come on down to Schemers Arcade. Hi, I'm Mike O'Donnell, one of the composers of the original Thomas the Tank Engine theme. And I'm here to tell you that I have released a selection of re-recorded themes and songs from the classic shows in a series of albums called The Engine Themes. These albums include a variety of classic themes and songs from the original TV series, as well as a few new compositions. You can purchase these albums on CD or digital download, as well as posters and pin badges. Have a look online at modmusic.co.uk. And for a special offer for Right on Track listeners, you can use the special code ROT20 for a 20% discount on all digital downloads. Be sure to enter the code when making your purchase. Thank you for your support and happy listening. Take care and stay safe. Okay, so we're going to dive into our next episode here, and I'm going to ask our lovely Mike to introduce it. It's episode six of series one. That is correct. Episode six, uh, Faith, Hope, and Anxiety. Uh, very, very heavy title for a, a kid show, isn't it, Adrian? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a it's a little intense. I'm a bit anxious just even hearing you say it, but we'll, uh, we'll bravely dive it's, in. It's all good. It turns out well in the end, I promise. Uh, the gist of this episode is that Matt and Tanya are very excited because Harry is going to take them on a fishing trip. Unfortunately, just before they are due to depart, Stacy arrives at the station and lets Harry know that there is a broken signal and that the Fireball Express will not be able to get through unless it is fixed. Therefore, Harry has to make the tough decision to postpone the fishing trip, much to the dismay of the kids, uh, because as we know, work comes before play. Uh, and the kids spend the most part of the episode here just trying to fill the time, seeing if there's anything they can do to help Harry in order to go fishing, uh, seeing if Stacy or even Mr. Conductor can take them fishing, which I think would have been a very funny visual. Um, <laughs> and of course, you know, Schemer comes in for his usual bit of, of being Schemer, which we love. Uh, Mr. Conductor, of course, Always. tries to uh, help the kids by telling them a couple fantastic stories about Thomas on his branch line. And of course, we get the the classic jukebox puppet band, along with um, some interesting things here. We get the picture machine, and we also get... I don't know how to dub this one, Adrian, because Mr. Conductor, you know, in later seasons, they had the magic bubble. But here, yes. Mr. Conductor introduces a little uh, animated section um yeah would just kind of by waving his fingers <laughs> <laughs> it just happens exactly just just like things do with mr conductor how do you know what can happen watch i'm going to send a train right through your imaginations all 
world. I really like this episode. I think it's it's simple, but it also highlights um, such a good thing about Harry's character. I really uh, this mm. is this makes me sad that I didn't get to see season one as a kid because oh. Harry is just such a perfect. You know, it's a good contrast to Billy Two Feathers, who would come later, because Billy was yes. sort of like the. He had more of like a father slash like cool uncle, like the one that you wanted to be growing up. Totally. Whereas with Harry, totally. he's such a perfect grandfather figure. I agree. I agree. And you know, in this episode, he he's very straightforward with the kids. You know, he just in in the way I think a grandfather would be. And I, I think you know we we often do see Harry's stricter side. Um, we know that he had a bit of a grumpy grandpa persona mm-hmm. at times uh, in in the show and apparently on set as well um, <laughs> but you know um, I agree I think this does really highlight Harry's character well because he knows he knows that he has to put his job first and he you know he also knows he's going to disappoint the kids but I think he also has a sense that it's going to work out and then we get to see you know we get to see the kids really experience that childlike disappointment of i can't do this my world is coming to an end exactly like they all they've got on their brain that day is fishing yeah. i imagine and the fact that they can't do it they're like well i may as well just die i mean and that i think <laughs> as 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 you know how dramatic kids are and how singularly focused they are that is that is very well captured in this episode mm-hmm. i agree it's done in such a wonderful way and again that, i think that helps to highlight the contrast between Harry's character and Billy's because I feel like if Billy was in this episode he would have given the kids you know a very comforting message and try and sort of soothe their hurt whereas Harry is just saying nope it's work before play kids we we have to get this done or a lot of people are gonna be disappointed and stuck yeah I was gonna I was gonna say dead but I think your phrasing is a lot gentler (laughs) train it's gonna be a mess kids (laughs) Don't look. Uh, yes, yes. So, you know, we get a really good glimpse at Harry. And I, I also read on the wiki that this is the first episode of season one not to feature guest stars. It is. Which I don't think it, I don't think it needs. No. Honestly, I, I we've got Harry coming and going um, and, you know, really tending to his railroad duties. And just, just to t- dovetail on what you were saying about Billy Two Feathers... We do get to see Billy being an active engineer, but I feel like we get to see Harry being more of a really kind of gritty engineer. Absolutely. Like he's, he's repairing a signal. He's got carrying the signal in his hand. Um, you know, I just feel like he, they, they just, they emphasize that more in the first season. They definitely did. I feel like you see, you know, as much as you see Billy in his workshop, I feel like you see Harry often doing more, railroad engineer things or annual labor exactly yeah you you see him more active around the workbench um as Mm -hmm. opposed to you know when billy would just kind of be sitting at the desk and conversing with the kids (laughs) you know (laughs) let me tell you exactly yeah yeah yeah. not that billy didn't have important things to say because he definitely did but you know you, you definitely see harry more active in the engineer role for sure So let's dive into this a little bit more here. So from your memory, from, you know, your own personal takes on the episode, what do you think of this one? Well, it was a favorite Mm -hmm. uh, as a kid. I mean, like I said, I I love all of Shining Time Station, so it's sometimes hard to pick favorites. But this episode did stand out to me. Um, And one particular memory I want to share that, I don't know, it just is really stuck with me. So I remember being very taken by the scene when... um, Tanya opens a letter from her friend mm-hmm. and it has that beautiful picture. And, you know, Stacy says, do you, do you guys think you could do something like that? Mm-hmm. And the kids say, I don't know. And then she brings out the paper and the, this beautiful music starts. And then we see the camera panning in on Matt and Tanya on the floor of the arcade, coloring, being kids. Mm-hmm. And I loved that segment. The music, again, like, as I recall it now, it could like probably still make me tear up. It just had this emotionality to it and sweetness to it. And I loved seeing the kids getting creative. And I have this really early memory because my, my parents divorced when I was quite young. Right. And I remember at one point my mom sent me to, uh, I, I would say like kind of a group therapy for kids kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And there was this one segment where we got to do art. And um, I remember sitting there and I drew, I drew the fish that Tanya drew. <laughs> I, I, I tried my best to use the same colors and that stripe on it and everything. Mm-hmm. 
And so as a kid, there was something that touched me uh, about that uh, segment. And I think it speaks to how Shining Time Station speaks to kids' heart. Like that's, I know sometimes people will say, you know, it's, oh, it could be sappy or saccharine, but I was a very sensitive kid. And so scenes like that, just, I just honed right in on. Absolutely. And you make a good point about the music too. I, I really have to give credit to uh, Paul Mason, who did the, yes. the score for season one. He came up with some really beautiful themes and motifs, and that is definitely highlighted here in this moment. Absolutely. Do you have any particular like memories of it watching it? You know, when you I, well, I, mind you, I was going to say when you were younger. More recently, <laughs> did did anything in particular stand out? Well, I mean, there's a few standout moments here for me. I, I like the whole episode. Um, hmm. You know, I I really like. I, I feel like Harry isn't meant to be a humorous character per se, but it's it's the <laughs> fact that when the kids are like, "What can we do to help you?" and he very seriously asks, "Do either of you have a number three hex key?" <laughs> No. I, I love that. He's like, well, thanks anyway. <laughs> it's, it's great. It's, it's so great. good. It, it's just, it's those subtle moments of humor where he's not intending to actually be funny that really just, yeah. like, make it. Um, the, obviously, we have to talk about Schemer. I I uh, adore the section where Schemer is trying to get the kids to draw, make him draw a certain season. Uh, oh. And he's giving all the reasons why he can't do everything but winter. <laughs> I, I know, and they're suggesting fall, summer, and like he's just like, no, no, uh, it's too hot, too hot. You know, there's too many colors. Just... <laughs> oh, well played. Oh, it's it's so good that that will always crack me up for sure. Um, oh God! And of course, I mean, we have to talk about uh, Ringo as Mister Conductor in this, uh, especially yes. in the first part where he literally appears out of the package that he has shipped himself in. To test mm-hmm. the efficiency of the mail train. Um, it's it's just such a, a charming little moment. And the thing that I really love about Ringo versus George as Mr. Conductor is mm-hmm. that even when he's trying to do his more humorous moments, there's still such a dryness to Ringo. Yeah. And it just makes it so much funnier to watch. And the delivery of it is always so good. Oh, he's great. I love the part at the end where he says, like, you better cheer up or I'm going to sit in this box and mail myself to Kulagumba. <laughs> and they're like, where is that? He's like, well, I have no idea, but I'm sure the kids there are cheering. Exactly. <laughs> and it's just, it's like, it's, it's, it's funny. And, and you've got the little detail even. I don't know if you froze the frame and you can see that they actually wrote on top of the box to Matt and Tanya, Shining Time Station, Indian Valley, like, yeah. on the address. Yeah. And I just, the little touches like that, including what you said, that him being, I, I'm, you know, I'm informing you, the mail train is very bumpy. It, it makes, it makes you think there are trains. It's just another element of realism. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, of course, the, the best bit being when they ask him what he's going to have for lunch and he goes, a whole shrimp. <laughs> Oh my god! Sorry, just even hearing you say it—it's the cutest thing. It's so cute. You like, gotta he love it. This, like, little Mister C with his like little knife and fork, and his bib. He puts <laughs> his bib on. <laughs> oh, I forgot about that. Oh, oh. Bless you, Ringo. We we, we really we, oh. you you gave us so much with your uh, your Mister Conductor performance. He did, and he had fun. You can tell he had fun. Like I, you know, I think maybe he had fun in spite of himself. I don't really know what he was. He thought he was getting into it first, mm-hmm. but he really connected with the cast from what I've heard. And, it, you know, he would often ask them like to throw him lines and stuff because uh, actually it's interesting in this first season, unlike when George came, they actually shot a lot of the live action station segments along with Ringo, whereas that was teased out in seasons two and three. Mm-hmm. And George shot all his green screen after the main station set had been filmed preceded by all the puppets yes. uh, segments. So I think it's interesting. We, we get, you know, Ringo, I think, really warm to a lot of the actors and I think had a lot of fun with the role. I get the impression, you know? I get the impression that he had definitely a lot of fun on set, but you can also tell he had so much fun in the promotional moments for the show when he was doing TV oh, interviews yeah. or anything like that. You can tell he was just like, 
I get it. I'm an 18 inch little man in this TV show, yeah. but like, it's a blast. <laughs> yeah. And what was his tagline? He said in every single interview. Do you remember? Uh, oh my God. I'm blanking. I love kids. I used to be yeah. one. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> every, literally every single interview. And I was like, oh, Ringo. He's got to have one, um, in, one but... little zinger in his pocket, right? He does, you know, and he also said, he's like, it's making, you know, it's winning me a whole new generation of fans. Yes. You know, these young kids who are seeing me as Mr. Conductor and not as, you know, Ringo Beatles. Oh, my God. Exactly. So, such an amazing performance, really. He, it is. And I think, you know, if he hadn't been touring, I think he might have continued. Yeah, I, I wonder about that. Because he did the Christmas special, in, which was in Toronto. It was the first time all, the whole set and everything was shipped up here. And... You know, he was still having fun with it, but I, I think he did want to tour and he'd recently, you know, gotten sober, mm -hmm. which I think was another big component. I, they talk about it in his autobiography. He was, um, you know, he got sober actually just after the filming of the first season right. when they were just about to start the press tour. Um, and, you know, some people would ask questions about that and whatnot. Um, but I really think, I, I think he worked hard to heal and... You know, he's a human being. I just, I, I guess it's a sensitive topic for me. I'll just say because I know a lot of folks in the fandom make jokes about Ringo's alcoholism. Mm -hmm. um, but as somebody who works with a lot of folks with addiction, I just have a lot of respect for him. Yes. And his, you know, how he's transparent about his recovery that he did with his wife, Barbara. And uh, I, I think uh, he had a lot of integrity. I know folks in interviews would ask him. I, there was this one reporter who was really harping on it. They'd say, you know, oh, Ringo doing a kid's show, whatever. And one of the parents of the kids, I believe it was um, Jason's mother, spoke up and says, excuse me, what does this have to do with this kid's show? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think they really stuck by him. Yeah, and you know what? You hit the nail on the head, especially when you're dealing with something like addiction or what have you. You know, it's, it's something that is very hard to overcome, and the journey mm -hmm. is a different thing for a lot of people. So kudos to Ringo mm -hmm. for you know, obviously getting through that and getting past it because it's, Absolutely. it's, it's not easy to do. So good for him. Good for him. And I know it's a bit off topic, but you know, it does often come up when people talk about the show. Yes, so. absolutely. And I, you know what, I feel like, um, because I think it was talked about that it was something that you know, obviously George did to kind of get away from his previous persona of being the, you know, the, the crazy swearing, angry comedian <laughs> to show a different side of him. Yes. So I feel like I feel like the show has been sort of a a savior for a lot of the actors involved in different ways. Really well said, Mike. Yeah, I would agree. Absolutely. Uh, now, before yeah. we dive into uh, the next part of this, I, I have to add because mm -hmm. you you had your little trivia, but I also have a little bit of trivia about this episode. Okay. Um, actually, not 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 trivia, but more of a more of a fun little goof. So. Uh, since you blew my mind about the missing seats in the Ferris wheel of Start Where You Are in the first episode, in this episode, when Stacy is talking to the kids just before she tells them that there's a package waiting for them, when yeah. she sits down on the arcade steps, you can actually see, if you pause it at the right moment, you can see a boom mic come into shot. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I, I I never saw it. I just actually read it on the wiki, but I didn't know. I never saw it as a kid. Yeah, I remember seeing it when I was watching the episode. I was like, what? What was that? Really? <laughs> you like, pause, rewind. Yeah, I just happened to catch it. I was like, that doesn't yeah. seem like it was meant to be in the shot, but <laughs> yeah. whatever. They didn't have to do a retake. It was totally fine. The occasional boom mic. It, but no, it's interesting. It's interesting what you notice, especially as an adult, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's uh, it, your adult eyes pick up on a lot of different things that otherwise your kids kid mind is just like, whatever. I, I don't care. It, this yeah. show is amazing. Yeah. They can have as many goofs it in is. it as they want. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, what was your perspective on the Thomas stories in, in Faith, Hope and Anxiety? Oh, well, you know, I I mean, I, I really love all of series one. It's just such a very comfortable era of Thomas for me. Oh, um, has my heart. But these stories in particular, it's funny because I feel like the consensus amongst a majority of the fandom is that, you know, these ones are sort of the less interesting stories. Um, Thomas and the Conductor yeah. in particular kind of tends to come up again and again. Personally, yeah. I, I really like this story. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a sucker for any story that involves, you know, Thomas, Annie and Clarabelle on the branch line. Um, uh, yeah, but I think the the way that they integrated this story into the Shining Time plot is also like very clever because Ringo just goes, 
oh, so you've been left behind at the station, have you? Funny you should mention that. <laughs> and then they go into the story about a conductor being left behind. That very thing so, happened to a conductor friend of mine. It's you, it's a great segue. It really is. And it's, you know, it's, it's nice that it's a more comforting story. Um, it's very mm-hmm. easygoing in comparison to other, you know, stories that would involve crashes yeah. or something like that. You know, it's it's something yeah. to kind of comfort the kids in their moment of being down about not being able to go fishing. So that uh, that's Agreed. a very wise choice. And then, of course, it seems like a no brainer that the episode about fishing involves the story Thomas goes fishing. How could it? Not? How could it not? It would be a huge missed opportunity if they didn't go for that. So, um, yes, I, I I adore both of these stories. I have such fond memories of mm-hmm. them, and they're just so memorable in their yeah. own right. They're lovely. They're lovely. And I, I, you know, kudos to the writers for choosing Thomas and the guard first because I, or Thomas and the conductor, because it's not the fishing story first. Correct. You know, so great. You know, it's not the obvious choice right away. Um, I, I will say of the two, I do prefer Thomas Goes Fishing right. just because I feel like as a kid, I think it had more action for me in it. But I also really enjoy, I enjoy Thomas uh, and the conductor and that's what it's called, right, Mike? Uh, American title, yes. Thomas and the Conductor. Okay, good, good. Yeah, I'm just so not used to saying it. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thomas and the Conductor. I love the scene between Thomas and uh, Henry, mm-hmm. uh, where he teases him. I've always liked that. And the whole thing with the you know Conductor running behind and that beautiful shot of them pulling into Farquhar at the yeah. end is, is lovely. And uh, yeah, Thomas Goes Fishing is just a classic, so no brainer on that one. You know what? It's a good point, too, that, again, this is at the point where they're sticking to the sequential order of the episodes of Thomas. So they're, you know, yes. they very well could have just swapped it around and done Thomas Goes Fishing first, but they had the restraint yeah. to, like, stick with the order of the episodes. We'll work our way around it. It's not a big deal if we don't get to the fishing episode first. I really appreciate that about, you know, how they made it all work in the end. Yeah. So that was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we also have a few songs to talk about in this episode. Absolutely. Uh, the first one we see being from The Picture Machine. This is The Kite Song. Uh, that mm-hmm. is sung, of course, by Kevin Roth, who many of you will also recognize the voice as the man who sings the opening theme song. Yes. Yes, indeed. What did you think of this one, Adrian? Oh, it's one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, it really moved me as a kid. Uh, watching it, I don't know. I don't know what it was about it. The longing, you know, losing something, chasing it, finding it. The visuals, especially at the end when he's kind of climbing what looks like down a mountain mm-hmm. and there's the kites fluttering in the wind. I just have really vivid memories of that. I love the song. Uh, shout out to Kevin Roth, wonderful guy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he did a beautiful, beautiful version of the theme song and he wrote songs for the show. So these are all written by him, um, and I assume I assume the producers would give him sort of you know a theme on what to write Makes on. Sense. But I like the lyrics, I like the melody. Uh, I was always moved by the ending. It's uh, hopeful. Yes, you know, it ends on a hopeful note. I feel. Yes, it definitely is hopeful, and you know, I, again, I think Kevin Roth has such a beautiful, calming, soothing voice. It's it's the perfect fit for a show like this. Like Velvet. Like Velvet, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and the, you know what? They always had really neat things to accompany his voice as well. Like the, the video always would go super well with the song that he composed. It did, and they, you know, they had a... I know they had a second unit for that uh, in the second and third series. I assume in the first. So they'd be filming, up filming these while they were doing the main the main set. So it's kind of interesting to know, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, a great a great job overall, and captures that sort of oh, I'm disappointed, but I'm gonna kind of see it through, and then it pays off in the end with this child finding you know the mother load of, <laughs> of kites in the forest. I remember as a kid, I'm like, oh, and apparently they got them all from a local kite store. 
That's uh, amazing. Give back to the community. The segment. <laughs> I, know, I know. I love it. So they just kind of borrowed them, strung them all up in the tree, and then had to have it. They rigged a special kite for uh, the kite that was running away right, right. in all the segments where he's chasing it. <laughs> but lovely job. Lovely job. Yes. Very lovely song. And then, of course, as, as per usual for Shining Time Station, we have the jukebox band singing the Wabash Cannonball. How about the Wabash Cannonball? Oh, wow. Again, oh sung God. by uh, Grace the Bass, Vanessa Thomas. Yes. Just phenomenal voice. Um, Beautiful job. And a, a bop of a song, I will say that. There's something about the bump, 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 bump mm-hmm. that it gets me every time. Like, it makes me want to rock out. <laughs> well, you, might, I, but... you know what? I always really like that, um, that before the song starts, the, the puppet band's talking about how they want to play something fast so that, you know, Schemer can't get mad because they're playing without being paid. <laughs> But then I think they mean fast as in like it's a short song because I always found it funny that they they oh. wanted to play a fast song but then they go into this like pretty mid tempo bop you know but it's still it's yeah. a fantastic yeah. song and you know I I really like that they pretty consistently I feel like they deviated a little bit more in their subject material in series two and three but season one in particular. Yeah. They really clung hard to like, we're going to make this band sing railroad songs. And it just, yeah. it fits every time. It's so good. Absolutely. Minnesota, where the rippling waters fall. No chances can be taken on the Wabash Cannonball. Hey, hey, on the Wabash Cannonball. We're going right in on the Wabash Cannonball. Hey, 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 on the Wabash Cannonball. Oh, yeah, on the Wabash Cannonball. We're going right in. Right Yo, stop playing in there! Great song. I love the introduction mm-hmm. when they're like, the Wabash Cannonball. Yeah. <laughs> one, two, one, two, three. It just like gets you into it. Um, th- so those little intros. And uh, yeah, the way the way you know Grace is singing, it's so soulful. And then also, which we didn't see in the first uh, jukebox band song, we get engine clips. Yes, we get to see a lovely big old locomotive, which I'm not sure somebody could probably say which one it is. You know, puffing through. We probably see a couple different ones, and it's just uh, oh, it's exciting. As as you know, obviously, a lot of us here love trains, uh, love steam engines, and we get to see that paired with. A, just a good kind of soulful, like you said, mid-tempo song. Exactly. Yeah, and you know what? It's it's yeah. funny because I feel like it's such a Shining Time Station is such a good gateway to getting kids interested in trains more in depth. You know, like you don't, yeah. as you said, I I couldn't tell you what the specific locomotive is that they're showing in this uh, in this mm-hmm. song, but you know, you see that and you're just kind of in awe of this huge machine with smoke billowing out of the top and it's coming fast down the track and majestic exactly like you don't you don't need to know the specifics of it you just you see that and it's just a very powerful thing agreed and i i must say this is probably one of my favorite endings to an episode of the entire series Mm -hmm. we get a great segue with schemer going hey uh I i forget what he's saying but he's yelling at the jukebox right you know, yeah. and then he looks around and he the, the eerie music starts to play. You know, I, I th- like you know th- his whole his whole uh, theme of this station is haunted. And Stacy, who had been at the information desk, was you know digging for something underneath. Schemer walks up with his back to the desk, and uh, and you hear Stacy going kind of huh what. A schemer is talking and then they both turn around and say <laughs> scream and it's so genuine i feel like the dd looks you know totally freaked at schemer of course in his classic and then and then they play this sort of like do 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 like spooky yeah. but sweet ending music and you see schemer kind of tripping his way out of the station and i don't know why but i cannot get enough of that ending i always as a kid found it hilarious because you've got schemer being his old suspicious goofy self you got stacy you know comfortably working at her at the information desk and then when he leaves she's still there writing and it just to me it's like oh that like sweet presence is still there but you got this fun little scare and goofy ending 
Yeah, and it's. I think this is the first time that we see because it becomes sort of a running gag in season one that Schemer thinks the station is haunted. I think this is the first time we see that actually come into play where he makes that proclamation. Um, I think you're right. But it's funny because, as you say, the first time you know him and Stacy kind of spook each other. Whereas I think I can't remember which episode it's in, but the next time it comes up, I think that's when Stacy actually scares him on purpose. So it's kind of, oh. it's kind of funny <laughs> to see that transition of like the first time it was an accident, but now it's like okay, we're gonna get him. Oh yeah, this place is haunted. Just get the feeling. This place is haunted. Huh? I said this. Ah! What? <laughs> She sneaks up behind him. I remember. Yes, I don't remember what episode yeah, yeah. it is, but she sneaks up and they all laugh and the high five. And I wonder if sort of as they were filming this, they saw again, the great chemistry between Dee Dee and Brian and how comical it was. And so then they're like, Oh my gosh, when Stacy realizes that schemer is a bit of a scaredy cat. Um, I mean, she had, I, I think probably, well, I guess they both had a reason to be scared at the end of this, but uh, I think she's sort of like, ha ha. Now, now I know, and that 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 riff carries on until I think it reaches its height at things that go Kahuga in the night, which is probably another one of my favorite episodes of the first Absolutely. season, which we'll come to yes. at some point. Um, really funny, and and I think sort of rides the wave of schemer's goofiness from like you said, you love the sort of winter, it's a snowstorm, <laughs> <laughs> and then actually, to be honest, what kills me about that is right after when he does the self portrait, and he asks them. <laughs> He says, hey, yeah, uh, self portrait does it look like me? No, not really. No, not the eyes. And their deadpan <laughs> about asking that makes me yes, laugh. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> hey, self-portrait, does it look like me? No, no, not really. It doesn't? A little bit, though. Does it feel good right in here? The nose? Brian, I, I, I love you. You're, you know, I think, I think as an actor... He is very underrated in general, and he should have been in more shows. Oh, 100%. He, I think the fact that he didn't get picked up for more after Shining Time ended is a huge disservice to his talent. It doesn't make sense to me, because Schemer was... I mean, he was so popular, he was doing personal appearances. Yes, exactly. The fact that he could carry an entire meet-and-greet on his own is a pretty big testament to how well-loved the Schemer character really was. No, Absolutely. Any other uh, kind of key points to this episode that that stuck out in your mind, Mike? You know, really, again, I'm going to circle back to it, but I think this is, as much as he kind of only shows up mainly at the start and end of the episode, I think it is such a good episode for Harry because Mm -hmm. it just, it shows you that he's a no-nonsense railroad engineer kind of guy. He knows that the work has to be done. But I feel like the ending is so sweet when, you know, he yes. comes along and he, the kids are just all down thinking they're never going to go fishing. And they're saying that, you know, they've missed the last train. And he goes, oh, really? Well, then what do you call that? And you hear the train whistle. <laughs> and he, <laughs> and he, he's, you find out he's fixed it and coordinated it so that not only can the signal be fixed, but they can also go fishing afterwards. So it's, it's just The Fireball amazing. Express isn't going anywhere without, <laughs> without this. this. <laughs> it's so sweet. I just... Uh, Great finale. I really like, you know, the Harry-centric episodes, as few of them as there are, they are definitely some of my favorites of season one, and this is no exception. Yes, yes. I find his character quite moving, actually, a lot of the time. Yes. There's, and especially in, in um, his birthday episode, which is, I think, one of my favorites. But I, I, I haven't thought about it that way, but I agree. Uh, I like when Harry is the focus because he's not... He's a really good... Not foil for Stacy, but he's a good counterbalance to Stacy's sweetness and overexcitement yes. at times. He really brings it down to like, okay, what are we working with here? Did you write that down? Is this done? You know, is he... I think it was a good choice. Yeah, and I mean, you see it more in, um, I believe it's in Mapping It Out when uh, they're yes. talking about, you know, 
uh, Stacy and Harry are kind of having the back and forth about you know how they're going to quote unquote discipline oh, yeah. the kids when they when they get back. Yes. But it's it's such a good way of representing you know I guess different styles of parenting. Like you know Harry is is a little bit more strict and he's you know obviously it comes from a place of concern that he's you know wanting to you know instill the lesson that you don't just go running off without telling someone stacy's trying yeah. to approach it very gently and it's i think it's presented in such a great way that it's like they are both coming from a place of love you know just because one isn't gentle well doesn't mean that this person doesn't love you and have your best interest at heart no i beautifully said mike because you have to have both you know when you're disciplining children we've got stacy with her sort of heartfelt we were so worried about you and then she also cuts in with you shouldn't go anywhere without asking permission mm -hmm. And that's a clear guideline. Like, don't do this again, because this is dangerous. You know, getting on a train and going with somebody else. Uh, I know we're talking about another episode here, yes. but yeah, yes. it, it, you know, it works. And then and you've got both sides that are equally valid. Yes, exactly. And either one without the other would be, you know, okay, but not great. You'd get maybe Tanya being overly disciplined or Matt being not coddled, but... Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with that, and that's really why I love the dynamic of Harry and Stacy because it just works so yes. well. Yeah, so completely well. agree. Anything else about this episode you wanted to add? I don't think so. I did realize, Mike, that we forgot to do ratings uh, oh, on the first. We did. One. So oh, goodness. So uh, gosh darn it. So why don't we do ratings for this one and then loop back to a place unlike any other? Absolutely. What what would you rate this one as? So I, I would give it either an 8 or an 8.5. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy this episode. Like I said, I love the music, I think, is a standout. Um, Paul Mason, lovely instrumentals. Absolutely. And that's an instrumental that kind of sticks throughout Series 1 especially. Great, I think, good pacing. Great use of the picture machine. Great ending. I did, I think, as a kid, find some of the, we're never going to get to go fishing repetitive. Mm -hmm. But in a way that's realistic, kids are whiny like that. You know, when they're going to do something, it's the end of the world, and then they're going to keep complaining and be all like, oh, like, what are we going to do now? So I think, I think as a kid, I, and that's maybe why my rating's a bit lower. I was sort of like, okay, we get it. Like, you don't want, you're sad you don't get to go fishing. Like, shut up yeah. already. <laughs> um, <laughs> to be perfectly frank. But as, as far as an episode goes and the choice of stories, the flow of the characters, solid, really solid. What about you, Mike? You know, I think I would feel comfortable giving this a pretty solid eight. Um, I think overall it's a really fantastic episode. Again, I I love the characterization of Harry. I love the lesson that it teaches. I love the Thomas stories that it's chosen. Obviously, it works very well within the grand scheme of the episode. Um, yes, I would agree. I think the pacing is what throws it a bit for me because I think mm. when you look at other Shining Time Station episodes, they do a better job of spacing out when the Thomas stories are told. Whereas with this one, it feels very quick. It feels like you get Thomas and the Conductor, then immediately following that is the yeah. picture machine, and then immediately following that is Thomas Goes Fishing. Yeah. So it's very front-heavy. Do you think they crammed in too much, or they just sort of redistributed it overall in the sort of half-hour, whatever, 22 minutes better? Yeah, I think, I think other episodes definitely distributed the content a little bit better. I think it had a little bit more breathing room. Because, um, again, af well, after you get past you know, Thomas goes fishing, there's still a lot of the episode left. And thank goodness that we have, you know, obviously Brian's bit as schemer, uh, the ending bit with, uh, with Harry explaining how they're still going to get to go fishing. And then of course the jukebox yeah. band to kind of carry us home. Um, yeah, but yeah, I think it's just, it's a bit strange, especially when you think about people who might only be watching shining time for the Thomas episodes. It's, it's kind yeah. of like a one, two punch with this one. So um, yeah. you know, I definitely would not say to anyone, you know, stop watching after the Thomas episodes because it's very much still an entertaining thing afterwards. But, you know, I think, I think the other episodes of series one definitely did a better job of, you know, let's put the first story in like the first, I don't know, five or six minutes, and then we'll save the second story for about 10 minutes or so down the road. So, uh, that, that's really my only sticking point with this one, but definitely a solid eight. Yeah. That's a very valid point. And uh, just another shout out to the ending. I, I, it's really hard to describe in words, but when I watched it as a kid, it just felt, 
I don't know. When I visualize watching the end of the episode, it just feels so familiar. It makes me think of like somewhere I know, people I know, like a summer afternoon. You know, the kids have kind of gone off fishing with Harry. They have a funny little scare moment, and then Schemer trots off, and Stacy's there at the desk doing her thing. It's just, uh, it's so, again, hard for me to put into words, but it has a comfort and a familiarity that I just would go back to because it felt, it felt like a family. It felt just good. 100%. Just felt good. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we'll loop back to our lovely opening episode, Place Unlike Any Other. So, Mike, what would you give this, this lovely opener? I think I would have to give this one, I'm going to say a 7.5. Uh, because okay. again, I, I do love it. I think it does a fantastic job of being an introductory episode. Um, you know, it, it's, it's definitely, uh, not as action heavy. Um, it's, it's mm -hmm. very much about the series finding its footing, um, which mm -hmm. I think was necessary. They had to do it this way in order to get kids familiar with the world, familiar with the characters, you know, all aspects of the station. And of course it's, it's about introducing the wonderful world of uh, of thomas and all his friends so i i appreciate that they had a bit more restraint with this one to take it slow again not introducing schemer right off the hop because i think that would have been a total yeah. sensory overload for a lot of kids um Great. but yeah i think I, it's it's a very solid way to start off the series and it, it definitely gets better as you go along but the first episode is not anything to sneeze at either Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely i i'm gonna go a little bit higher mm -hmm. i i really really love this episode i'm gonna give it a nine out of wow. ten okay give it an a plus on my end i feel like it really it really welcomes everyone to the world of the station you really get a feel for the set and the way the set is a character in and of itself, we 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 get a lovely court, sort of um, panning shot of the whole mural with all the sound effects. We get to meet sort of all the, the we get to see all the different arcade machines, see how the ticket desk works, and it just there's something at the about the way it establishes the lore of the station, the fact that it's incredibly old. It has this history way beforehand with Stacy's grandmother, her connection to it. And obviously she has a really deep investment in revitalizing a station, restoring it to its former glory. Mm -hmm. And I think, interestingly, like sort of, you know, my journey with restoring the jukebox and bringing it back, I think maybe I haven't thought about it until this point, this, till this moment, but it is kind of that, you know, appreciation of old things. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, wanting to still value them and value their beauty. Uh, I think that's what really ropes me into this episode. Your points are all totally valid. And, you know, I, I wouldn't give it a 10. I think maybe because it's, it's not entirely Shining Time Station without Schemer for right. me. Mm -hmm. uh, even though I agree it would have been sensory overload. And it is slower paced. Uh, but to me, I just, I love, I love the music, I love the pacing, and I love the way that the actual set is center stage in this episode. So shout out to Wayne White, who was the set designer in the first series, really established the look of the station, and actually designed uh, and, and, and colored all the jukebox band sketches mm -hmm. as well. So he was, uh, he was really instrumental in, in establishing that look, and I think it, it works. It absolutely does. I, I I really cannot picture the setting of Shining Time Station being anything else than what it is. They did a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. They nailed it right from the get go. Yeah, and I mean, think about it. It's the same guy who did Pee Wee's Playhouse, very, which is a show I, I never mm -hmm. watched mm -hmm. as a kid. Very different kind of very set. Very different. But just love it. What can you not love? <laughs> Hi, I'm Ken Bianco Jr. from Train World where we have the greatest selection of model trains and train sets. We also are proud to carry Bachman's full line of Thomas & Friends products. With a large variety of different brands and scales, we have the best items for your model train collection. You can find Train World on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram, where you can see our latest products and even be invited to all our events like Thomas Tuesdays. 
Visit trainworld.com today to find your next addition to your model railroad journey. It's so fun talking about it with you, Mike, because it's just like, you know, hearing your joy and also kind of discovering things that are going to pop up for us along the way too. I think, yes, ab- as we absolutely. And I mean, this is a joy to do it with you too, because obviously you, <laughs> you have so much involvement in the shining time world with your other podcast and the jukebox restoration yeah. and all these other neat things. So it's, it's fun. It's fun to just go back and revisit this series that really means so much and, and shaped childhood. Yes, absolutely. And I think, you know, another thing we've been talking about, we'd love to incorporate some special guests as we go yes, along. Yes, for sure. Um, there's a lot of folks that would be, I think, very keen to come on the show and recall some of their memories uh, for, for our lovely our lovely listeners out there. So uh, please spread the word and uh, let us know your feedback. Let us know what you think of the episodes, what you liked, what you didn't like so much, maybe things that we missed. We'd love to hear from absolutely. you. Absolutely. We value any and all feedback here. Yes, yes. Um, And it's just been a joy. So I'd like to thank you, Mike, for uh, coming along this journey. Oh, and thank you. I'm I'm glad that we we get to do this, and I'm definitely looking forward to doing some more. Yes, me too. Uh, And thank you to Tom as well, who is, uh, is, is here but not with us at the moment. So thank you to Tom and his enthusiasm for this show. Uh, which he, you know, also discovered in later years. Bless you, Tom. We, uh, <laughs> you, you may have shown our friends your Thomas the Tank channel, but we have shown you the, the Shining Time channel. <laughs> well, so we hope you think we, it's quite good. <laughs> we, yeah, right. Hopefully, we've given you your time to shine <laughs> oh. uh, today <laughs> as well. Um, and thank you, everyone in Listenerland, for joining us. I have been Adrian. I have been Mike. And we will see you hopefully very soon for the next episode of our little podcast. See you soon, everybody. Bye. Bye.